Good morning, everyone. This is a, a great day to be able to worship our Lord together. Uh, welcome to everyone that is here. Welcome to all of you that are online. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful time for us to be able to worship together. Um, uh, I, I normally don't begin uh, our, our services, but uh, this morning I uh, uh, want to uh, uh, give you one announcement to let you know that uh, our Welcome Back Fall event kickoff is uh, this afternoon, uh, starting at 3.30 at Praise Park, and we hope that, uh, that everyone will be able to make that. Uh, there will be food and games and, and uh, entertainment by Heartland Sings. Uh, we'll have uh, soft serve ice cream uh, and, and a, 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 an opportunity to find out more about uh, the ministries that are happening here at St. Joe. Uh, uh, the rain has looks like it has pushed off, but, uh, but it could be a hot one. So uh, you might want to bring an umbrella, not for rain, but for shade. Um, and uh, bring a lawn chair, uh, and uh, let's just enjoy this time that we have to all come back together uh, and uh, celebrate. <clears throat> uh, the other reason that I'm starting this service is uh, um, there have been some great things that have been happening with, uh, with our YMCA campus just down the street, and uh, uh, Pastor Gabrielle and I wanted to sit down and, and have a conversation um, and just convey a little bit more about, uh, about uh, that relationship. And uh, so we've got a video of our conversation, and I'm, we're going to watch that and then turn it over to Mike and the praise team uh, so that we can worship. Hi, I'm Mitch Norwood, senior pastor here at St. Joe United Methodist Church. And I'm Gabrielle Ginder, the campus pastor at St. Joe at the Y. We thought that we would have a conversation together and uh, just talk a little bit about why or how we relate to each other, the, the Reed Road campus and the YMCA campus. and Maybe share a little bit of what we know about the Y and the WHY and why we've done this. Okay, well, so it's my understanding that at one point, uh, St. Joe here at Reed Road uh, uh, started looking at the neighborhood and, and saw that it was changing. And so they wanted to find a way to, to reach out to, to a, a basically different uh, community. Uh, the, the YMCA was, was trying to do more things to bring the C, the Christ, into YMCA. And so uh, the, the partnership just grew. It's right next to our Praise Park. Uh, so it, was, it just seemed like a natural thing to do. Yeah, I think it really is. We've talked a lot about how the church's mission and the mission of the Y for a healthy body, mind, soul to share Christ with everybody is sort of both of the mission field uh, for the church and for the YMCA. Mm -hmm. So, then, so we are connected. Um, uh, how, you want to talk a little bit about about our structure and, and the ways that we are connected? Sure, I might toss some of that back to, to you. Um, but really, we are one church. We have a shared connection. So. The, the leadership administration of St. Joe kind of oversees both campuses. But that does not mean that we're always going to do the same things the same way. For right? sure. So one of the things that's been a real interesting learning for me is the, uh, the target audience for St. Joe at the Y is primarily people in the Y or who live right around there. So there's 18,000 members of the Y and we spend our days investing in those people many of them unchurched, many of them hurt by the church, but there's also a lot of believers. And so what we are doing there is we're pouring into them as they go to their churches and empowering them to teach Jesus and be missional and all the things that we think are important. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think a lot of people may not understand that, that St. Joe at the Y is not just a worship service that happens on Sundays down at the Y. You, you do a lot of stuff during the week. For sure. So one of the things I do in inviting people to partner with me is we do a prayer table every day uh, for about four hours. We're there and uh, have a bowl of lollipops, suckers, because that'll bring parents to the table and just invite people out what's going on in your life and to let them know that somebody cares about them and is praying for them. Uh, we also partner with them. We help with volunteers when the Y hosts Bloodmobile. But then again, we get to interact and get to know people. It's, the, um, it's an amazing partnership um, because we are sharing life and doing life 
every day together. Mm -hmm. and, and also building relationships with the staff at the YMCA, yeah, which yes. is a, a big part of what you're doing and the collaboration that's going on. Yeah, because yeah. we think, gosh, the staff has it all together and they, like, they're people, right? And so we get to say, we're so thankful for what you do here. We do an annual staff appreciation day. Um, but also, as we live with them throughout the days, we get to know what's going on in their lives and be praying for them as well. Mm -hmm. uh, super important. You can't talk about Jesus if, uh, to somebody if they don't know you and trust you. So this is one way that, that we as St. Joe United Methodist Church can be for the fort. of a hard edit <laughs> we weren't ready for that all right we are for the fort we are most certainly for the fort we're for him uh, for Jesus and sharing Jesus uh, and a great way to do that is to be able to branch out into uh, down at the Y uh, and to be able to do uh, the things that we do down there but we move into his courts this morning together to celebrate our God to keep our attention our focus on him his presence is here and we know that his presence is here because he has told us. He's told us in scripture. But will you join me in our call to worship this morning? So who releases us from our bondage to sin? It is God who draws us from the depths. And who feeds and tends our lives? It is the risen Christ who nourishes us. Praise be to God who has saved us. Praise be to Christ. I'm just going to laugh. I'm not sure what's going on with this life today. I'm sorry. It's a new song we introduced last week. joy overflowing kind of a song. We pray, we praise our God. We proclaim our God this morning. To join as you're able or just allow the words to pass through you in praise. Oh, I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures of faith Are never enough came along, yes, Jesus, and put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied, hearing your love, there's nothing better. Right. 
grace to God is. You turn grace into God is. sleep last night, so <laughs> I'm all pure praise right now. <laughs> this is a song, uh, it's one of my favorite worship songs. We were talking a little bit about uh, uh, before the service with the worship team, and, and uh, it's a song that talks about uh, worship being more than a song. And so as we sing this song, maybe allow the words to just simply be a prayer, and I want you to think on them. I want you to praise, I want you to celebrate God, but I also want you to think on the words that we're saying. We're praying. So we continue through worship. We continue in song, but we continue in prayer. So think on these words. Allow them to just saturate your, your soul as we continue to move forward this morning. You may remain standing as you wish or seat uh, or be seated as you wish, however you want to continue to move through his course this morning. of worth that will bless your heart and I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required and you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into and I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it And it's all about you, yes, Jesus it's all about you, Jesus. The King of Endless Worth. A King of Endless Worth. No one could express how much you deserve. And though I'm weak and poor, it's all I have is yours. 
Tunes, favorite songs, favorite prayers. I want to move into a time of prayer, sharing of joys, concerns, those things that we're, we're thankful for, those thanksgivings, and part of our gathering, the purpose of our gathering, and one expression of our gathering is to give thanksgivings to God. So sharing those things, it's an act of worship. So anything at all, anything at all we want to share. Those of you who are online, feel free to, to, to share those. We'll try to get to them uh, as quickly as we can in the service. Anything at all, joys, concerns, thanksgivings. I'm thankful Nathan's here. Hey, buddy. <laughs> yes. Uh, successful first week of uh, college for my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, successful first week of college for, for your daughter. Anything else? Anything else? I have prayers. I want prayers for a friend of mine who um, had gone through treatment for breast cancer, and she is getting her central line taken out this week. Okay. So it's the last step to be finished. So. We're in the last step of overcoming yes. breast cancer. Your friend. What's her what her name? Her name is Donna. Donna. Okay. So prayers of Thanksgiving for that. Friends healing. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah. For, um, I think it's going to be the next month or so um, for my family to be able to be meeting down um, to see my nephew play down in IU. So I, I'm really thankful for that because they, my mom, my and her siblings just haven't been able to really get together for a long time. So <laughs> yes, she informed really us. <laughs> so we're excited. We're excited for football. <laughs> Family gatherings, being able to get back together. Yeah, especially since both my both of her parents have passed, my grandparents. So it's been really hard to finally get them back together. Yeah, so we, we pray for you guys and we celebrate with you guys as well. We're coming back together around IU football. <laughs> Anything else? Anything else? Um, yeah. 
my um, for my cousin that's in the hospital, not feeling very good, um, and for my aunt, aunt that's um, still going through treatment for um, I think the early stages of leukemia. So. Okay. Prayers for healing for family members. Prayers for healing. Anything else? Anything else? Chuck? Yeah. A phrase, a friend of mine that we've been looking out in prayer, Mark went back for a checkup on Thursday to Cleveland Clinic and got a good report that his progress is in the pump and he's lost some more weight and uh, they're very grateful for all the doctors and nurses that are attending to him over there to his experience because he's been through several heart surgeries in his lifetime and neck surgery Celebration for Mark, praying for him. Anything else? Anything else? Well, this last Tuesday I went to my grandpa's funeral, um, and uh, being a preacher's kid, I've seen a lot of funerals. I've been in, in the church, I've seen a lot of funerals, and, and it was uh, one of the most attended, packed rooms I've ever I've ever seen. Um, which made me feel really good. He was he was totally sold out to the gospel um, and sharing it, and he impacted a lot more people than I ever thought. So prayers uh, for him, a celebration, a graduation for him. Uh, and then uh, we found out, I think it was the day we were heading to the funeral, that Vicky's great uncle passed away. So we pray for, for her side of the family, dealing with that. But yes. A couple from online. Uh, prayers for those in the path of Ida down by New Orleans. And uh, Sarah Harper says, Praise that she's been able to get out to walk some mornings this week. And prayers for healing of pain, mind, and other peoples. All right. That's a Thanksgiving, Sarah. I know you can hear me. So. <laughs> That's a Thanksgiving. Hopefully, we'll see you later, maybe. Um, anything else? Anything else? Prayers, absolutely. Prayers for Afghanistan. What a, what a, what a tragedy over there. A couple more online. Yes. Um, Nadine Snyder says prayers for my husband who's having hip and leg pain. And uh, another one for prayer, praying for Dave Snyder, the family and friends of those killed and in, injured overseas. Prayers for those. And a friend of mine's son, his name is Nick Valance. Valance has attended, um, just completed his tour of duty with the Marine Corps. He knew many of those who died in Afghanistan. So, Nick needs lots of prayers to deal with that. So, to those missing, as well as the family. From Logansport, Indiana. So prayers for for the Marines and dealing with that. I know my brother-in-law is in the Navy, um, and he's right on the edge of getting out. So we're you know, praying nothing heats up so much that he has to go back out on the water. So prayers for for them. Anything else? Anything at all? I want to pray for 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 sleep. <laughs> the, my little friends, they were keeping me up. I think part of it was my fault because I gave the older two, I gave them cookies right before bed. I was eating windmill cookies, enjoying myself, and then they decided that they needed them too, and then they stayed awake until like midnight, the horse plant, so I, I didn't sleep. I was mad then, now it's funny. So thank goodness for, <laughs> for that. But let's pray. Let's 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 move for, uh, forward in his courts and pray. God, you have heard uh, the joys in the room. You've heard our songs of praise, our exaltations, our celebrations of you and what you have revealed to us in Scripture. We praise you for that gospel that you have given us. That good news. 
But God, give us the courage to share that good news, to share that good news with others. There's so many things to be thankful for, God. Maybe we don't mention them. Um, so we think it's just a given that we have these things. But God, help us to recognize those things that we should be thankful for and help us to give thanks for those things. God, there's many uh, situations where we are in need of healing. It's always a major concern. May your hand be on those who are in need of healing. May your hand work within the doctors. <clears throat> May your spirit breathe into them, give them confidence and courage in you. And draw those who are going through the process of, of medical care right now, draw them closer to you, God. And there's so many things to be joyous about. We celebrate here at St. Joe together. We celebrate the body of, of believers here at Reed Road. We celebrate those who are being reached and impacted down at the Y, just down the street from us, God. Continue to use us. Use us. Use our words so that we may share the gospel. Use our actions so that we <coughs> may do good works and celebrate you, God. Help those around us. Use us. Be with us. And lastly, thank you for the awesome privilege that we have to continue to gather so freely and to worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Mike. So we're moving along in our study of First Peter this morning. <clears throat> the fourth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. And there's some really difficult passages as, we, as we've seen in 1 Peter. And this is another one. What we'll find Peter doing is telling his audience that it's not appropriate to be always looking out for number one. <clears throat> kind of like the, the song we sang, Heart of Worship. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things that I've made it, and it's usually that we make it about ourselves. But it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. As a Christian, we should have an attitude of self-denial. So my dad has always been a great example of what a faith-filled man should be like. He's been that example to me and, and to many people that he's encountered over his life. Growing up, baseball was very important to him. So it was uh, when he uh, started college, he went uh, to, to a college in Florida that was the only school in the country at the time that had a baseball management degree. His college experience was interrupted by a stint in the Army uh, but after his discharge, he eventually found his way to Washington University in St. Louis. He had loved the Cardinals ever since he was a little boy, and that was a dream of his, to be going to St. Louis. He ended up interning with the Cardinals while he was in college, and then he went to work for them after he graduated. That was all during the glory days of St. Louis when Stan Musial was their big star. And he loves telling us how, how Stan would call him over in the, uh, in the clubhouse and, and ask my dad to, to help him figure out his stats. After a few years with the Cardinals, uh, my dad transitioned out of baseball and went to work in the life insurance industry where he'd spend most of his working career. And that's how our family uh, found our way to Evansville, Indiana. He went to manage the New York Life Agency in Evansville. And after about four years of that, the company made a decision uh, to, to combine uh, regional offices all over the country into super regions. And they offered him a promotion uh, to work in this new super regional office that Evansville would be a part of. And guess where that office was located? 
St. Louis. He had always dreamed of one day moving back to St. Louis. They showed him the office that he would have uh, when, he, when he took this new job, and, and it was in a, a, a tall building, and it overlooked Bush Stadium. This was an opportunity of a lifetime for him. But after contemplating this tremendous job offer, he turned it down. You see, at the time, um, I, had, uh, I had graduated from high school, was a freshman at Purdue, but my three sisters were all in high school, freshman, junior, and senior in high school. And he just could not bring himself to move the family away from Evansville at that crucial time in their lives. He denied himself so that it wouldn't disrupt their lives, even though that was one of the, the biggest dreams he could have ever imagined happening to himself. That concept, denying oneself, is not something that many people are in the habit of doing very often. Actually, it's usually just the opposite. We normally try not to deny ourselves anything, we want the promotion. We want to be in the places that we like best. But Peter lays out in this scripture some reasons why we should deny ourselves. Starting with verse 1, 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered as a human, you should also arm yourselves with his way of thinking. This is because whoever suffers is finished with sin. Now remember here, Peter is, has addressed the, his audience as aliens or, or foreigners in, in this world that they live in. And here he's saying that if they want to experience life in the world that they're living in, the way that God wanted them to, to experience it, that they should follow the example of Jesus Christ and emulate the attitude of Christ. When he says to arm yourselves, he's using a military term. He's saying that, that they're in a war against sin and they should treat it like they were in combat. Because if they don't, it just might destroy them. I don't believe that we think in those terms very often today. Because we usually justify our own actions by comparing ourselves to someone else who, who we think commits more sins than we do, or doesn't live a, a, a life of faith quite like ours. The great radio broadcaster Paul Harvey used to say, sin always starts out being fun. But if we're going to experience life the way that God intended, then we have to do as the scripture says, and arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ so that we avoid sin rather than, than dance all around it and then into it. Paul Harvey was a person that relied on prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit because he knew that if he didn't, he was going to fail. If we have the mind of Christ, it says then that through our suffering, just as Christ suffered, that person is going to be done with sin. Now that's not a real easy thought to comprehend, but remember, Peter has just been talking about baptism right before this. And when we consider Paul's characterization of baptism in his letter to the Romans, chapter 6, it makes more sense. Verse 1 through 11 in Romans 6 says this, Should we continue sinning so grace will multiply? Absolutely not. All of us died to sin. How can we still live in it? Or don't you know that all who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried together with him through baptism into his death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. 
If we were united together in a death like his, we will also be united together in a resurrection like his. This is what we know. The person that we used to be was crucified with him in order to get rid of the corpse that had been controlled by sin. That way, we wouldn't be slaves to sin anymore because a person who has died has been freed from sin's power. But if we died with Christ, we have faith that we will also live with him. We know that Christ has been raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. He died to sin once and for all with his death, but he lives for God with his life. In the same way, you should also consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive for God in Christ Jesus. So Peter is saying those who in their baptism have shared the sufferings and the death of Christ have risen to such newness of life with him that sin has no power over them. And while this is not easy, as Christians, we say goodbye to our old way of life and celebrate in our new life. Continuing in verse 2, 1 Peter 4, As a result, they don't live the rest of their human lives in ways determined by human desires, but in ways determined by God's will. Peter is contrasting a life lived by human desires and a life lived by the will of God. God's way is not to not pursue the evil human desires because they're wrong. Living that way deprives us of the vitality that God desires for our lives. As Jesus was heading toward the cross, he asked God to take this mission from him, to not have to go to the cross, to not have to die if that was possible. But what he ended that prayer with was not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. That's the ultimate self-denial. We pray that in the words of the Lord's Prayer, whenever we say the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done. But you've got to ask yourself, do I really mean that? Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Because if I'm, if I'm denying myself, then, then I'm not going to be happy, right? Well, that depends. If your attitude is like that of Christ's, then that won't be a problem. And remember, happiness is not the objective. That's not what God promises. The, the objective is obedience. And so if you deny yourself, then you're going to end up being happy. And you'll have a lot, of, lot more respect for yourself. And other people will have that same kind of respect. Recall the words in John 10, 10. Jesus said, I came so that they could have life. Indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. And if that's the case, then we must be able to both deny ourselves and live life to the fullest. Which doesn't seem necessarily like they go together, but, but it, it, it says it here. There's a strong case here that the meaning of Jesus and Peter's words are actually that the way we get the most out of this life is to deny ourselves and instead pour into others and into, into Jesus and, and get the focus off of ourselves. Think about the times that, that you might have worked hard to make something very meaningful for someone else. You may have grown tired from working to do that, but it also probably brought a deeper kind of joy than you normally feel. And there's other evidence in the scripture that self-denial should be our model. Matthew 16, 24 and 25, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. 
And then Peter reminds them as Christians they can and should move away from their former sinful lives. Leave the past in the past. Verse 3, you have wasted enough time doing what unbelievers desire, living in their unrestrained immorality and lust, their drunkenness and excessive feasting and wild parties, and their forbidden worship of idols. The Greco-Roman world at that time was known for being morally out of control. Many people would say that that compares similarly to today. So go ahead and add whatever sins and addictions that afflict us today to this list of vices. Verse 4, they, the unbelievers, they think it's strange that you don't join in these activities with the same flood of unrestrained wickedness, so they slander you. The audience of converts that Peter is talking to would have participated fully in that morally bankrupt life that he characterizes here. He's encouraging them to abandon those activities because they're contrary to the will of God. And while they may not cause immediate damage, the long-term effects of, of continuing to be involved in that lifestyle could be detrimental. All kinds of health problems are are exacerbated through excess drinking and smoking and eating and, and sexual promiscuity and even from the lust of power. And for those non-believers, Peter has a word to say about the consequences of their actions. Verses 5 through 7, they will have to reckon with the one who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Indeed, this is the reason the good news was also preached to the dead. This happens so that Although they were judged as humans according to human standards, they could live by the Spirit according to divine standards. The end of everything has come. Therefore, be self-controlled and clear-headed so you can pray. <clears throat> there will come a time when, when we will stand before the Lord on Judgment Day. That's not a topic that we typically talk much about, but that doesn't mean that it's not real. Hebrews 9.27 says people are destined to die once and then face judgment. As Peter says in this translation, there will be a reckoning. As Christians, our lives aren't confined to the time these earthly bodies roam the world. But while we're here, we have the opportunity every day to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow Jesus Christ. This is how we show our faithfulness to God. And then Peter transitions into probably the most important part of this scripture. He's been talking about how Christians, uh, they, were, they were to live among non-believers and how to do that. And, and now he tells them how they were to live in community with each other. Verse 8 starts off, above all, show sincere love to each other. Because love brings about the forgiveness of many sins. Part of living together as the body of Christ, as, as a family, is to show that we sincerely love each other. And in love, this community forgives the sins of each other. Verse 9, Peter continues, Open your homes to each other without complaining. This is about being hospitable. My mother and dad have always displayed the gift of hospitality. When my sisters and I were all teenagers, one of our youth leaders called our, our house Norwood Grand Central Station. Um, our parents welcomed just about anyone and everyone, and we as the church need to do the same. When we're open and welcoming to new people, it truly shows the love of Christ. And don't forget the part of the passage that says to do it without complaining. Through COVID, our numbers haven't, haven't been like they used to be, so it's not as hard to pick out folks that are visiting on Sunday morning with us. But it, it still can be easy for someone to be rather anonymous if they really want to be. But most people want the connection with others. They want to be in relationship. So when you see someone new, 
um, help help St. Joe be for them a, a place that's not big and cold by taking an interest in them. Talk to them. Don't let them to con continue to feel like strangers. Show them the love of Christ by being hospitable. Welcome them. Verse 10, and serve each other according to the gift each person has received as good managers of God's diverse gifts. This is vitally important for us. All the different people that we have here with so many different types of gifts come together as Christ's body. If everyone doesn't utilize the gifts that God has given them, then the body doesn't function as well as it should. So whatever gift you have, whether that's big or it's a small gift, just know that we need it. We need you. When we all come together in service, that's when we make the most impact on the world. Verse 11 continues this way. Whoever speaks should do, as, do so as those who speak God's word. Whoever serves should do so from the strength that God furnishes. Do this so that in everything God may be honored through Jesus Christ. To him be honor and power forever and always. Amen. Two of the gifts that are used extensively by people within the church are, are preaching and serving. Peter is saying here that a person who is preaching should preach as, should speak as someone who has a message from God, not someone who just offers their personal opinions or biases. And for those who serve, they should serve by the strength that comes from God, not as someone who's just doing a personal favor for someone. The attitude should be that what you give in service, you first received from God. And that attitude helps keep pride out of the equation. Peter says that living in community is about being loving, forgiving, welcoming, and serving. If we live by these standards, we're going to be a church that collaborates rather than one that tries to just put on the best show. We're going to be a church that's more about Jesus Christ and less about us as individuals. A church that's more about denying ourselves and less about calling attention to ourselves. No matter who you are or what you've done in this life, you have the opportunity to decide what happens to you for eternity. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Doing that will not only help you navigate this wild world that we live in, but also allow you to live with God forever. If you're not prepared to take up your cross, prepared to die, then you can't truly live. If you haven't done it already, step out in faith and accept Christ as your Savior. Let us pray. Lord, in this crazy world we live in, help us to understand that we need you and we need each other. And we need to live in peace and harmony, loving, forgiving, welcoming, and serving. Help us take the focus off of ourselves and place it directly on you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing one last song together before we move out into the world. Find you. 
by your side for all of time. Who could have found a deity so great? A man who raises people from their graves. Who could have found the man? King of kings, so holy and divine. Who is like the Lord? Nobody. There is no one like our God. The more I seek, the more I find. You're the greatest of all time. Stand with me. Proclaim these words. Who can make the blind see? Who can make the blind see? Nobody but Jesus. Who can make the deaf hear? Nobody but Jesus. Who can make the lame walk? Nobody but Jesus, there is no end to you. Yeah. Who gets all the glory? Who gets all the glory? Nobody. Nobody but Jesus, the moral of the story. Nobody but Jesus, who is holy, holy. Nobody. Nobody but Jesus, there is no end. denying ourselves will bring us the greatest joy that we could ever imagine. 
So go in that peace and have a great week. Amen. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. There's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Yeah.